Um, but again, um, welcome to all of you who are here in the room, huh. to all who are watching online, and to all who will one day see the transcript or the recording. Grace and peace be with you in the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm not sure about you, but for me, the last eight months since we gathered in June for convention have been a bit of a blur. Um, June, we had convention, which was unusual and, and meant different rhythms and patterns of preparation and follow-up. July was general convention, and that happened in strange ways, but for a bunch of us, that was still another thing. In late July and August, I went to the Lambeth Conference as Bishop of East Carolina, and that dragged on until nearly December. Um, actually, what dragged on was the COVID and kidney stones I brought back from Lambeth. Um, seriously, and I asked Sandy to verify this with me, by the time I was starting to feel anywhere close to fully recovered after the kidney stones mostly was, was into December, um, and by then I'd also stepped down as Chancellor of Sewanee two years earlier than expected. And I want to start with a clear thank you to those who have been understanding, patient, and supportive uh, of me and, and of my limitations during much of that time. Uh, you know, we can live with hopes and dreams of what it is that we're going to accomplish, and then life happens. And so I've done the best I can, and I can honestly say that I've learned some new skills. My memory does not work like it did before COVID. Now, whether that's because I'm 62 instead of 61, or it's long COVID, we'll never know. But I have notes now when I speak in ways that I didn't ever have notes before. And some would say that's probably a good thing, Bishop. One of the key moments in um, my time in these last eight months was actually um, a moment from General Convention that's now been shared with you. The address, the sermon that was offered by newly elected House of Deputies President Julia Ayala Harris uh, on the closing day of General Convention. Um, I thought her words were powerful anyway, but my first reaction was certainly that I, I, I know this but increasingly, some of us have to acknowledge that we're part of the endangered species. If we want to think of ourselves that way, I try to think of it as, you know, some of us need to get out of the way. Some of us need to be active in bringing more people to the table and making sure that more folks are able to be fully a part of the kingdom of God as we're living it. But I heard those words in the first instance as, some of you older members of General Convention better get out of the way because us younger ones are ready to take over. Paul, was that the conversation that all you 40-year-olds had? I, I, I'm, I'm just teasing. But I know Paul's worked with a core of younger leaders who've been invited by our previous president of the House of Deputies and will be continue to encourage to provide good leadership at General Convention and across the church. And I'm not so old that I don't remember being one of those younger leaders in my life. And it's critical that we find ways and make ways to invite to the table people who aren't normally there. So at first I had a a particular reaction to what the House of Deputies president had to say. Not bad, but sharp. And then I realized what happened is it had taken me back to my studies from the 90s when I was doing some extra um, academic work and took me back to a, a paper that I wrote in the 90s that was titled, Wanted New Wineskins. It was using the same biblical passage that she'd used in her address as a basis for uh, a study of the congregation I was serving and the reality that some of the old ways weren't working. We had new life bursting at the seams and we weren't equipped to deal with that new life. And at that time in my life in ministry, those were words. That was a passage of scripture that was very important to me. And since her sermon, I found myself continuously reframing much of what we face together, much of what I face together, in that reality that life's changes will be continuous. And a part of life is always holding on to those old wineskins that contain the wine that tastes the best, maybe, that's been aged properly, alongside of the new ones that can be flexed and stretched and, and have room for the new wine that we maybe haven't seen fully come to maturity yet. Before we reflect on 
what might be some new wineskins for us as a diocese, let us take some time to consider the new wine that is showing itself all around us. We see signs of God at work in our midst, always doing a new thing. One of my joys as bishop is to worship with a different congregation every Sunday. Now, a lot of you, when I visited, have also heard me say that being in a different congregation every Sunday is one of the strangest things for someone who used to be in the single community for all of the seasons of the church year with devotional life built in those rhythms and relationships. But honestly, almost every Sunday I visit another congregation, I have a chance to witness the new wine of God's love. Just since Christmas, I've been with the people of St. Mary's Gatesville, St. Timothy's Greenville, St. Francis Goldsboro, St. John's Wilmington, St. James Bellhaven, and tomorrow morning at bright, shiny o'clock in the morning, I'll be getting on the road to be with the people at Christ Church Elizabeth City, 9 o'clock adult forum, 1015 confirmation class, worship at 11, 1030? I get there and you guide me through it. You'll start when I get there, thank you. As long as we're done before the Super Bowl, okay? We need to have eyes to see, though, because sometimes in the places where we live and worship week by week, we don't see things as new. We may not fully appreciate that this is God at work and not just our own efforts. We, we may think, and I get this a lot, that every congregation does things the same way. Or we might think we do it better than everybody. And as the one who gets to go from place to place, I can put that in perspective a little bit for you all. But the truth is, I think we can witness new wine all across the diocese and even as we gather here for convention. You know, hopefully before you got here or since you've been here, you've had a chance to review the annual reports. I know a lot of you have attended workshops and I've heard some really positive things of your experience with those. You've hopefully had a chance to visit with exhibitors Hopefully you've listened to this morning's reports. I want to draw a few, um, I would call good news stories or God at work stories, new wine. Um, this is an older ministry in some ways for us, but this year we can celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Interfaith Refugee Ministry based in New Bern and now having expanded to have an office in Greenville. There were a couple of years there where there wasn't nearly so much work for the interfaith refugee ministry. The number of refugees being welcomed into the country probably hit an all-time low in their time and their ministry. But in their report, they make clear that in 2022, they were able to serve 87 refugees from seven different countries, as well as 12 Ukrainians and, and one Afghan who'd come in different and special circumstances. And so our thanks to Susan and her team for the good work they continue to do, which certainly is new wine for those who were involved in it in the moment, for those whose lives are changed because of the kindness and commitment of people who share in that ministry and interfaith ministry, not just us as Episcopal Church. I hope that we can draw hope and encouragement from the advances made by those working to establish our school for ministry. Those of you who have been coming to convention for a few years may have heard me speak about the need for this every year. I'm used to hearing people wonder, so Bishop, when are you going to stop talking about it and do it? Well, there's a lot of problems with that question because it's not usually me. It's usually us. You heard that description that if you want to move fast, go along, go alone. If you want to move well, do it together. But moving together is always slower. And I've sometimes spoken my ideas and my thoughts, and I'm so encouraged to watch a council of people come together and start giving shape to a school for ministry that will help us to prepare people for leadership and ministry across the diocese, clergy and lay. And I hope you join me in being encouraged by the number of women and men who are stepping forward to offer themselves for ordained ministries in response to God's call. I think we ought to be getting excited as we witness the number of people, lay and clergy, who are willing to stand for election and serve important ministries of our diocese. I won't get into the details in grand scale, but those of you who joined in with one of our pre-convention meetings, uh, if you were in on the first one, you heard about how there were still lots of spots open for nomination 
And by the time we got to the end of that process, we've ended up with five elections that we need to do because we have more than enough people willing to serve. We also have nominations that come from our deaneries and from me. And I think we've done as well as we've done in a long time in gathering people who are willing to serve and help with that work. And I see that as a positive sign. Maybe we're coming out of the COVID realities of our lives in a way that we are able to trust a little bit more in the path forward and commit ourselves differently than we felt we could commit for a few years? Maybe, but I'm excited to get to work with all of the folks who have stepped forward in that way. So thank you. And I think we can also see in the reports and in some of the, the presentations um, that there are a number of transitions happening amongst the leaders of some of our significant ministries. And I want to identify a few and, and say thank you, knowing that um, as soon as you try to do that, there are inevitably some people you don't remember to name or transitions that you didn't even know were happening, in my case, sometimes. But from about the time I came as bishop, Hodges Hackney um, has served as the uh, president of the foundation of the Diocese of East Carolina. And he's now led his last meeting, and Jordy Witchard has led his first meeting. Jordy will take over the leadership of our foundation. John Pollock has been the leader of our Commission on Ministry for these last years. And if you haven't heard it, I think I shared this with the clergy, but not with everyone else. Uh, John had to pick up and leave suddenly for South Carolina, where his mother is approaching death, and I ask that you keep John and his family in your prayers. John's term on the Commission of Ministry has ended, and with his recommendation and support, we've invited Nathan Finnan to be the next chair of the Commission on Ministry. Curcio is a ministry that depends heavily on lay leadership. Carla Richardson has been the leader of that diocesan ministry. I'll say with words that we all understand and not give you the technical language from Curcio the leader of our diocesan ministry, and Diane Hatfield, who has been with us, I don't know if Diane's still here, will be taking over that role. Jean Wayman, who somehow, maybe by choice because you've been chairing the convention committee, have ended up in the front row. Uh, was that deliberate, Jean? Yes, it was. Okay, okay, thank you. It was good, good, good planning. Um, Jean is ending, with this convention, Jean is ending his time as chair of the convention committee, and so we thank you for that service. And, and I gotta say at this point, the committee will be taking over and we'll work it out from there. And we, as you'll see, we've got a, a full team ready to go. Um, and as we celebrated together today, um, Ed Hodges is stepping down after five years, this time at least, of service as chair of the board of managers at Trinity Center. And Barbara Whitesides will be stepping into that role. Um, I, I don't want to add other speeches to what was said well in the expression of thanks this morning. Um, but I remember being really grateful in the midst of recovery from Hurricane Florence when Ed was able to go alongside the folks at Trinity Center and be supportive in the way that they needed at a time I certainly couldn't do that because we had about 30 properties that were suffering as a result of Hurricane Florence at that time. Um, and it was just too much for any of us. And we did a little bit of divide and, and work and and and, Ed um, did wonderful work there and with transitions and COVID. Ed, thank you. That kind of natural transition is um, to be expected and to be celebrated and can be seen as an opportunity in a moment when new things can happen. Not every new leader or new team of leaders needs to be bound to doing things the way they've always been done. And we need to celebrate as new leaders uh, bring us new opportunities. We are blessed in having so many faithful followers of Jesus ready and willing to serve and to lead in the life of our diocese. And in this keeping with this idea of new wine, where new things are happening, um, I'm very excited to watch as we bring to you a budget that includes a new staff position, a position um, that we're calling, at least on a preliminary basis, coordinator for ministry with people of African descent. In the responses to the work we did through our discernment that led us to the mission priorities, one of those things that would come up regularly was the need for us to be involved in work of reconciliation and healing 
bringing people together across races and backgrounds. We're following a model that's similar to the one that uh, we followed with Fred in his work with people in Spanish language. Uh, we look to hire a priest who will serve as priest in charge of one or more of our historic black churches, while also supporting the ministry of the other of our historic black churches. This will be somebody who will support the work of our Racial Healing Commission, not leading it, supporting it. The lay members, the clergy who are part of that commission will continue to lead, but this person will be a resource and will help with that work. And this person that we intend to hire will uh, help to challenge and equip all of us to more fully engage with the communities where we live and serve as we grow into our fourth mission priority, which reads, advocate for justice and peace for all of God's children working together to remove obstacles that prevent equitable access to resources, while building bridges that work to reconcile and heal the divides between us. With convention's adoption of the budget and with the support and direction of the Executive Council afterwards, we will soon launch a public search to fill this position, a full-time position, but one to be shared between the diocese and congregation. So now let me get to some reflections on new wineskins. As we bear witness to the things that God is doing in our midst, we must also recognize the importance of being willing to shift our patterns, to reallocate our resources, all with the desire to build new wineskins to hold the new wine, new clay jars to hold the treasure of God's great love in Jesus. I believe that this is true for our congregations and for our diocese. By the way, I think it is also true for the whole of our Episcopal Church. COVID has interrupted our familiar patterns of the past, in some cases challenging us to recognize needs for change that predated the pandemic, but which we may have been unwilling um, uh, to observe. This has not been only an East Carolina thing. Every aspect of our lives and our society have been affected. Unless we live in isolation, let me share some information from the life of the wider Episcopal Church. Did you know that the median size of a congregation in the Episcopal Church in 2021 was 21? Half of our congregations across the nation had 21 or less people in worship, and half had 21 or more in worship. I'm guessing you're all measuring where you are, which of those 50% segments. My experience is most people think that the norm is large congregation and that they're an exception. Did you know that 90% of the churches in the Episcopal Church had an average Sunday attendance in 2021 of 100 or less? 90%. 1% only had an average Sunday attendance of 300 or more. The other 9% were somewhere between 100 and 300. Did you know that the average Sunday attendance in East Carolina in 2021, by the way, 2021, because it's the most recent year for which we have records that we can, we can use. The average Sunday attendance in East Carolina in 2021 was 3,476 people. Now that's not counting online worship. We have statistics about that, but anybody who's looked at those kinds of statistics knows that those, those numbers raise as many questions as they provide answers. About 30% of the diocese in the Episcopal Church would see more people than us on a given week, and about 70% of the other dioceses see less. Don't let anybody tell you that this is a small diocese. Now, in Province 4, the southeast, the numbers are a little bit different, and we're more at mid-range or, or on the smaller side. That's about the southeast compared to the rest of our nation. But across the nation, 70% of the diocese see less people in, or saw less people last year on an average Sunday. Now, here's the number, the kind of number that has made all of the wonderful media that want to predict our demise. Um, from 2020 to 2021, attendance on an average Sunday in the Diocese of East Carolina dropped by 28.7%. Now, I could be a little bit 
light with you and say, with COVID out of the way, I expect we're going to see some numbers that go up that we haven't seen in forever. We'll see. About two-thirds of the dioceses across our country saw a greater drop than 28.7%. I've seen some at 50% and higher. Did you know that in 2021, our income from plate and pledge was $14,609,735? We are not a diocese without resources. We are not a diocese that should, none of us should preach scarcity. There's an abundance in our midst. It's really more about how we use that, how we make decisions. Only one-third of the churches across the Episcopal Church in the United States, at least in this case, saw more income in 2021. Although, again, in our province, our region, 74% of the diocese saw more income. So, again, we can get that idea of ourselves based on our closest neighbors. For us in East Carolina, our 2021 income rose 7.1% from 2020. Did you know our income went up? Our income in the congregations, plate and pledge together, that doesn't mean each, was, each one of you experienced that. But when I'm in conversation with some of you who talk about the great challenges of a drop, I, I often share, did you know in other parts of our diocese it's not like that? Across the Episcopal Church in the U.S., in that same one-year period, there was a 3.3% increase, so a little bit less than ours. Now, in other presentations, I've tried to point out to you members of committees that you can go to with questions and all. This time, I want to name the Reverend Paul Kennedy of Christ Church New Bern. Um, not because he will answer all of the questions I might have raised with you, but because in his service to our wider church, Paul chairs the task force on the state of membership in the Episcopal Church. And they are deeply challenged now with finding right ways to measure our life and our ministry so as to help us make choices about growing in vitality and developing good strategy. Paul, thank you for your willingness to serve in that way. We actually have a number of people in this room who are leaders at General Convention when we gather. It's always good to go with them. In East Carolina, I would argue, we need some new language and strategy for our congregational life. Our definitions in canon speak of congregations that become missions and parishes. And while at some level we've set that language aside and don't pay so much attention to it as we might once have paid, in reality we've got an awful lot of congregations that don't reach the standards defined for missions or parishes. They won't have enough members to be able to be a mission by that definition. They don't have a resident priest or a priest in charge in the way that those definitions require. And you know what? If you are feeling less than valued by the language that the church uses, it's not a good thing. I would propose that as we continue to learn from the Small Church Project, the good work that's begun as we bring leaders together to share experiences as we work to develop strategy, as we develop new wineskins, we're also going to need to change the language that we use when we speak of congregational life. I kind of like the language of 1 Corinthians 12 when we talk about the body of Christ made up of different parts. I think you know that passage. They're probably not allowed to use the Bible and the Constitution and canons, I'm not sure. Um, but I think the principles can, we'll leave that to our Chancellor and Constitution and Canons Committee, but I think that some of the principles that are built into our system need attention so that we can recognize the realities we face rather than just measuring ourselves and our life on old principles. During this past year, um, the continuing deans from the year before have worked together to reimagine re the purpose of deanery life with the hope of finding ways that we can further support and strengthen networking and growth in ministry. Now, some will happily groan about deaneries because so many things have been tried, so many things have not worked over time. My thanks to the group of deans who have done that work together, and my thanks to the new, full, strong team of deans that are ready in place to begin this, continue this work of developing new wineskins, what it is for us to support one another regionally, 
How do we strengthen that? How do we do it better? Across the diocese, some of our process is cumbersome and creates extra burdens for congregations. I'm not sure why it took me this long. This is my ninth convention. I've always experienced the frustration of being on diocesan staff as we get ready for convention. And somehow, maybe because of the language that the president of the House of Deputies offered that stuck in my head, somehow this year I heard it different. So I think if you took the time to ponder on this, you could acknowledge that one of the busiest times in the life of a congregation would be somewhere between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Advent's kind of a busy time. Worship at Christmas is important. It's often the time of the year when we see more participants in worship than any other time. Pastoral demands are usually higher because for many people, that's actually a tough season emotionally. So why is it, do you think, that that's when it is the diocese requires you to elect delegates? When that's the time of the year when we expect your vestry to make a pledge to the budget of the diocese, and you haven't even yet got your year-end finances in order or fully formed your next budget. I would argue that the things that we do in our life that we've always done in our life might not make as much sense now as they maybe once did. I'll, I'll give the idea they maybe once worked. You put that together with the fact that when the finance committee works hard to make decisions about the money that you've all pledged, just like you might wait for pledges before you set your budget, we wait for pledges. It means we have hours before convention to develop a budget. Hours. And we're already into the year for which the budget's being developed. Maybe a group like the Finance Committee will be willing to consider the idea of building a budget on past history, on trends. You know what? No matter how often we ask you for 10% or 11%, we faithfully get from you 9% or a little bit more. There's really good evidence to say we can count on that. And we have really good evidence to say that you are all faithful to your pledges, that almost without exception, the pledges of the people of East Carolina rise to the level that you've said that they would be. At our upcoming Executive Council retreat in the early part of March, we're going to begin a process of review of some of that structure, which I think can easily be shifted in some fairly simple ways. I don't want to give those away because I don't want to be the one that presents them by myself. And I hope that if not before, by next convention, we'll be able to come back with some ideas about new wineskins that will better serve our congregations in the ministries you have and our ministry together as diocese. Not everything benefits from new wineskins. Let me be clear before you all want to rush the stage and say, Bishop, what's, what's wrong with the good old stuff? Nothing. You know, some of the good old stuff is how we contain some of the treasures of our faith and tradition which we carry forward with us. And we need to care for those wineskins and we need to treasure that rich wine. But in our work, we also need to learn how to use both. Not every one of us, not all at the same time, not all in the same place, but together with the resources God has given us. Hold some traditions, add some traditions, offer them in parallel. I don't remember having to use water so much as I do these days, excuse me. So now I want to come to the last section of this address. Um, there's one word for the title, the word revival. All of this conversation about new wine and new wineskins is important and deserves our attention. But I got to say, I'm expecting that the most exciting and important thing that happens in this diocese in the year to come is the revival that is scheduled with our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, and his team for Saturday, October the 21st. Yes, you can put that one on your calendar. Saturday, October the 21st. Now, please do not rush the stage with your argument for why it should happen in your town or village. We'll get there. The real joy is that Michael, presiding Bishop Michael Curry, excuse me for the informality, um, presiding Bishop Michael Curry will be with us all week. As I announced last year at convention, he will be with our clergy for their conference, the 17th till 19th. 
On the 19th and 20th, I imagine we're going to tour him around the diocese and help him to see some things and meet some people that maybe he hasn't seen or met yet. The revival will be centered on October the 21st. And then on the next day, on the Sunday, he will be with the people of St. Joseph's Church in Fayetteville in celebration of their 150th anniversary. Now, you'd think with something this big and important, we would have been working at this for years. Well, I have got the emails from 2019 that demonstrate we were right on track. And then what's the word we always say? COVID. The meeting we would have had, the next meeting that would have brought our folks together, would have been for dates that didn't end up being possible. And so as the pandemic seemed to clear and the presiding bishop's office was getting back to scheduling things instead of not scheduling things, we got our dates on the calendar. And through a wonderful God story that I won't share now, maybe sometime later, it took us this long to get the leaders from his office together with us. And so this week, a core of leaders from the diocese will be meeting online with Jerusalem Greer and Canon Stephanie Spellers from the presiding bishop's team. We will steadily build the team from there. Uh, we have a set of guidelines that have come from that team, and I want to read a little bit to you about revivals as they understand them, because we all have different language. Some of us will cringe because we associate it with folks we see on TV or that we've encountered it, other things. Here's what they intend. Each revival seeks to revive the hearts of Episcopalians in the host diocese and throughout the wider church, stirring love for Jesus, for each other, and for creation. To proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ in the language of the people. To equip and send Episcopalians to share and listen for stories of Jesus' loving presence in daily life through training that may occur before, during, and after the event. Organize people for reconciling action and justice that embodies good news in the context. And gather a diverse body that intentionally crosses lines of age, race, class, and or culture. Engage in intensified prayer and preparation before, during, and after the event including gathering and equipping a diocesan network of intercessors. Some of you pray? Okay. Call Episcopalians to intentionally, personally invite and welcome people who are not actively following Jesus. One, to attend the revival, and two, to join the Jesus movement. We have a lot of work to do and decisions to make, like where will the, where will the revival happen? What location? What focus should it have? And normally that conversation happens before location is selected. Those are the conversations, the decisions that our, our organizing team will be led into this week. And we will just keep building from there, bringing others in as we know more clearly where we'll be, what we need to do, what kind of music, who's going to lead the prayers, who can do the prep, et cetera, et cetera. There is prep work, not just for the event, but prep work for our lives as we get ready to host a convention, a, a, a revival. Um, there is the event itself. I have no idea how many people to expect. Last time he preached publicly in this diocese, well, I don't know if we count my ordination. It was in a, an equestrian center not far from here. Or if it might have been at the 200th anniversary of the diocese when it happened to Christ Church. And that didn't really feel like it ended up being a really public event. We had to manage things a bit. I, I think there's a reason to expect a lot of people to be with us. My wife um, is part of a Bible study here in town made up, I think, of everyone but her is a Presbyterian. They're excited about Michael Curry coming to the area. <laughs> the idea of us inviting is serious, and the idea of us praying is important. So please hold Saturday, October 21st in your calendars. Start to put that on the calendars of your congregations. Get that idea there. We'll be doing lots of communications as we know more details and sharing those as carefully as we can. For now, please pray for God's Holy Spirit to lead us. Please watch for a steady stream of communications and information. Please plan to attend the revival and watch for other ways to participate. And please, count on new wine. In closing, um, last evening I offered words of thanks to all sorts of people. And if you weren't here last night, just watch the video. I'm not going to repeat them all today. Um, but I meant it. There's a lot of people that contribute to our gathering, and everyone's contribution is to be valued. 
but I want to offer just one more word of thanks that I didn't offer last night, and that is to the current and former members of the Standing Committee of the Diocese, who, as part of their responsibility, understand uh, the care of the bishop to be a priority. And so I had a three-month sabbatical plan for 2020, and then COVID. Um, so that really functionally ended up being two weeks. Um, and they've affirmed that I should be finishing my interrupted sabbatical from 2020. And so my thanks to them, I, I still have some significant doubt about how that can happen in the same year as we have a revival. I guess if it becomes clear that it can't, then Rob Richardson, president of the standing committee, will renegotiate. But I'm grateful for their support and for their care of me on your behalf. And so now, glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>